Welcome all of you for the third lecture in the series of uh, lectures on uh, what we call as modern physics. We have been preparing the ground for discussing photoelectric effect and the kind of challenges that it threw open and the radical explanation or the description given by Einstein. Of course, we have not yet started the discussion of the experiment per se. In the first lecture, what I did was essentially to give you the broad framework. And in the second lecture, we revisited the experimental evidence for the wave nature of light. There was a slight deviation that we made compared to what you study in your textbook. In your textbook in class 11 or class 12, when you study interference, you study it as a generic phenomena, common to all wave phenomena. But here, we specialized that study to electromagnetic waves, made use of the fact that light consists of electric field, magnetic field. Electric field is perpendicular to the direction of propagation. And the direction of the electric field is also important for the interference effect. So by manipulating, by tuning the direction of the electric field, you can alter the interference pattern. And that would conclusively establish that light is a wave phenomenon in the manner that is exactly anticipated by Maxwell. That is the most important thing for us. And our analysis also showed that Whereas the pattern where the maxima or the minima will occur will depend on the frequency and of course the part difference. But the brightness itself will depend on the square of the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field. Brighter the light, greater the energy. Therefore, again in agreement with natural properties of waves that the energy carried by that wave is proportional to the amplitude squared we are also able to get an experimental evidence. So we are on really secure ground when we say light is a wave phenomenon. So it automatically almost says that the corpuscular theory of light propounded by Newton is incorrect because the corpuscular theory explains neither reflection, nor refraction, nor evanescent phenomenon, nor double slit experiment. None of them can be explained by the corpuscular theory, whereas the wave theory does that. And this is where the importance of the photoelectric effect comes because it started springing up surprises almost the same time, probably even a little bit earlier, that Maxwell wrote his famous wave equation. So let us discuss the experiment today. So let me repeat the timeline that I gave you at the end of the last lecture. So 1887 is when Hertz discovered photoelectric emission. He could not make very detailed studies of this phenomenon. All that he observed was that when these intense X-rays actually, they went and fell upon a metallic surface, electrons were ejected, and you could actually identify them to be electrons by subjecting them to an electrostatic field, and they got deflected as negative electrons should do. That, of course, requires the knowledge of an electron. Hertz could not have decided that. He could have only said that it is a negatively charged particle. But in 1897, J.J. Thomson discovered the electron. And now you can look at the current. You know the electron. And you can actually decisively establish that the current that is being produced is by the electron. 1888 onwards, even before the discovery of the electron, all the way up to 1902, Halavak and Lennard made a series of experiments trying to find out the properties of these photoelectrons. So what are we saying? The electrons that are emitted when radiation impinges, falls upon a metallic surface is called a photoelectron. And the current that is produced is called as the photocurrent. 
So a good question to ask is, what does this photocurrent depend upon? That is where the surprising results started. We will describe that in great detail. This is only the timeline that we are interested in. And in order to understand these results, in 1905, Einstein gave his theory. It is really not a theory. We should call it as a model. The real theory comes much later when Schrodinger wrote his wave equation. So Einstein gave his model for the emission of the electrons. This model not only explains uh, photoelectric effect, it can also explain thermionic emission. Thermionic emission is the phenomenon where the electrons are ejected when you heat because you are going to supply enough energy. Whether it is radiation or temperature, it really doesn't matter. But the most decisive experiments came in 1915-1916 when Millikan made very, very careful measurements. We should understand that the basis for Einstein's model was actually given by Planck in 1900. Planck was forced to give that explanation because otherwise black body radiation, which is not there in your syllabus, cannot be understood. There is no way to make sense out of it. So Planck had introduced this Planck constant, but for five years between 1900 and 1905, nobody took that seriously including Planck himself. It was Einstein who boldly believed in the concept of the photon. He did not coin the word photon. That was coined by, actually by a chemist. That is a different matter altogether. But he believed in that quantization of the electromagnetic field. That radiation comes in packets of energy. It is not a continuous phenomenon. That is what Einstein said. We will learn a lot about that in the next lecture. So he proposed the theory, but then everyone was rather lukewarm to that, in fact hostile against that because they thought the whole thing is against common sense and whatever we know experimentally. But once in 1915-16, Millikan made his, performed his famous experiments very, very carefully. One could see that one could not escape the conclusions of Einstein. That was the only viable model. That is something that we have to remember. So what I'm going to do in the next 45 minutes or 50 minutes or whatever is left of me of this lecture is to discuss these experiments slowly and describe to you what kind of a crisis that this experiment precipitated, it caused. That is what we have to do. So here is a picture from your uh, NCRT textbook. So you have a source, which powerful source, which hits on a surface which will produce X-rays or wavelengths of very, very large frequency. So you put a quartz window here, so which allows only the radiation to escape and stop everything else. And that comes and hits the photosensitive plate, which is a metal, and it produces the electrons. So this is the cathode, and it is connected by the anode. Now, you want to gather all the electrons that are emitted by this metallic surface. So what you do is, you put a voltage. So that will allow you to measure the current. So greater the voltage, then more, of them, more and more of them will be gathered because you are going to accelerate them. Or you can do even something better. You could apply an opposing voltage, which will, if the electrons are coming in this particular direction, you can apply a voltage in the opposite direction that will produce an electric field between cathode and anode. The electrons will experience a force from anode to cathode. Is that right? Because the electrons are negatively charged. And you ask, what is the voltage at which not a single electron reaches the anode? And that is what is called as the stopping potential. So photoelectric effect has a very important concept or quantity. And that is the stopping potential. Your textbook denotes it by phi naught. You could also denote it as V naught. It is done many, many times. 
So, if you look at this stopping potential, what is that? This is the minimum potential difference. required to stop the electrons from reaching the anode. If the potential difference is less than the stopping potential, some of the electrons will manage to sneak in. If the potential difference is greater than that, then they will be repelled and they start going back. So stopping potential is the suspension potential. The electrons come to rest. So this is the potential required to stop the electrons. So what we are doing is to look at the maximum kinetic energy of the electron. So you have your cathode. You have your anode, light is hitting it, the electrons are coming. So let us say this electron has an energy K1, kinetic energy, this electron has a kinetic energy K2, so on and so forth. So there will be one electron with the maximum kinetic energy K max. So what should be the stopping potential? It is not sufficient for me to stop K1 or K2, I should stop the electron with maximum kinetic energy K max, that is what I should do. Therefore, my charge of the electron into phi naught must be equal to maximum kinetic energy of the electron. We are employing the notation which is given in your, that are emitted. So the quantity of great interest is this K max and let me define that for the sake of completeness, maximum kinetic energy. So that is what we have. So this is the experiment. So on how to manipulate the Potential difference is shown through the commutator and the voltage and the potentiometer. So you people have done enough number of experiments in your laboratory, hopefully. Otherwise, please go and perform these experiments. Request your teacher that you should all be taken to the lab and you should do experiments involving potentiometers and resistances so that you understand that, insist on that. And then you will get a complete picture of what is happening. You of course need an evacuated glass tube because you don't want any dust which will stop. You don't want any resistance for the motion of the electrons. And there could also be stray ions which can actually corrupt your data. So what you do is you have an evacuated glass tube, create as good a vacuum as possible and then you perform this experiment. So this is a very nice schematic picture and that is what we have shown. So as you can see it is figure. 11.1 in your textbook, class CBSE, class 12 textbook. So now, if we want to appreciate what is happening in this experiment, one very important ingredient in analyzing any experiment is to know what are the relevant parameters and what are the irrelevant parameters. So you want to study a phenomenon and I should be able to find out which of them are important for what I am studying, which of them are not important for what I am studying because in an experiment there will be all kinds of things that are going on and not all of them are equally important and some of them are actually completely unimportant. So for us here, since energy is being transmitted to the electron, that is very, very important. Energy is being transferred to the electron. Intensity is important because my expression for the energy carried by radiation, the energy density is nothing but 
epsilon naught E squared is the energy density. On the other hand, if you are studying thermionic emission, temperature would be important because when you heat, it is the temperature that dictates how much of energy is transmitted to the electron. Because again, by equipartition theorem, if the metal is at that temperature, the mean kinetic energy will be given by 3 by 2 kT. So, in the case of thermionic emission, it will be temperature. That is what we have. The experiments were performed with different wavelengths. Why do I perform experiments with different wavelengths? In the case of the double slit experiment, wavelengths are important because that is what dictates where the maxima and minima are. In the case of photoelectric effect, we perform an experiment with different wavelengths because we want to show wavelength is an irrelevant parameter. That is very, very important. Wavelength is not an important parameter. Okay. This is not an important parameter as far as stopping potential is concerned. Phi naught is concerned. But is it not important at all? The answer is no, because the way you understand the ionization of the electron is that, imagine my electron is tied to the lattice through some simple harmonic interaction, so it is like a spring. Now, when the electromagnetic wave comes and falls upon the metal, my electromagnetic wave is an oscillatory electric field. So, let me write that. So, what you have is an oscillatory electric field. Therefore, there is a time dependent force which is acting on the simple harmonic oscillator namely the, the electron. So, you have forced oscillations. In your mechanics course, I am not going to get into that. You have learnt that under the forced oscillation, if there is a resonance condition, if the applied frequency matches the natural frequency, the amplitude starts increasing. So, what is happening? Imagine my electron is trapped in a potential like this. Actually, it is going to fall off because it is going to get ionized. For very, very small displacement, it will be simple harmonic motion. But as the displacement becomes larger and larger, it will not be simple harmonic anymore. And as soon as the amplitude hits this particular point, then the electron will get liberated. And you can easily compute the time required for the electron to get ionized. In other words, the energy supplied is one particular aspect which is coming from the amplitude of the radiation, but the time taken in terms of the language of the forced oscillations, their frequency would be an important thing. So, it is very well that the early experimentalists actually made use of that. So, this is another very, very important parameter for us. Now, the third quantity which you can see that I have listed here is the material that is used. So, we speak of metallic surfaces. Metallic surfaces have what are called free electrons. They are rather loosely bound compared to the dielectric media. That is why we have dielectrics. It is not easy to move the electron. That is there the response is so weak. If you apply a potential difference between the two ends of a dielectric medium, no current will flow because the electrons will slightly get displaced but the attractive force is so strong, it will simply go back. It will find a new equilibrium position. Whereas, in, an, in a metal or in a conductor, if I apply a potential difference, these are very, very loosely bound. Therefore, they start moving and they produce a current. So, you should actually impinge radiation or make the radiation fall on a metallic surface. But then there are metals and metals and uh, conducting materials. That is what we need. So, it depends on the material that is used.
You people might have heard of something called Hall effect, for instance. When you apply across the electric and magnetic field, the Hall voltage that is developed depends on the material, depends on the temperature, depends on the density of the electron. So there are many, many properties of the material that we have. Temperature. Density of the electrons. Etc. Etc. So what we are studying is assuming that the wave theory of light is correct. We want to use photoelectric effect as a probe to understand the properties of the material. And this is a superior probe compared to what you study in the case of dielectric media or conductors because you are really not probing deep into the material. You are only asking, you know, what is the conductivity, what is the permittivity, what is the polarizability. But here, you are actually able to get the electron out of the surface. So this is a better probe. So we can imagine that all these gentlemen, Hertz, Halowag, Lennard, and later Millikan, were actually trying to use this as a probe. And that is what even now solid state physics people or the condensed matter people do. So these are the relevant parameters that are involved. And we want to find out what the photocurrent and what the stopping potential depend on. How does it depend on the intensity of radiation? How does it depend on the wavelength of the radiation? And how does it depend on the material that is used? Before getting into the detail, it is actually good to give you a preview of uh, whatever we are going to do. So for this reason, I call this sneak peek. You know what a sneak peek is. If there is a movie, the producer of the movie puts a trailer on the net on the YouTube. So you watch that and you get a flavor of what is happening. That is a sneak peek. So we'll give you a sneak peek and we'll tell you what the results are. And then we will go on to study them in detail. So basically what the experimentalist found was that you take the maximum energy, as you can see here, of the electron. You add the potential phi naught. Now I have made a mistake here obviously because they do not dimensionally match. And that is unfortunately because we are many times used to putting the charge of the electron equal to 1. So when you come to higher studies, it is measure, better to measure all charges in the unit of electric charges rather than measure the electric charge in the units of Coulomb. Coulomb is a definition, whereas we know every charge is a multiple of electrons charge. In fact, even proton is a multiple of electron charge with a factor minus 1. So let me correct the expression, correct this slide. So what I am going to do is to look at k max plus Ev0. So this is my famous electron volt, the energy required to be acquired by the electron when it is taken over a potential difference of whatever V0 is. So V0 is equal to phi0, never mind about that. And then I am going to divide it by the frequency. So this is my frequency. And this is a constant. So C is a constant. This is the great experimental result. What is it a constant? In what sense is it a constant? That is something that we are going to elaborate upon in great detail. But since I am showing you some kind of a trailer or a sneak peek, C is independent of the material, C is independent of the frequency, C is independent of the amplitude, therefore it is independent of the intensity. But this is all what we have, therefore, and that means C is a universal constant. What does not depend? on any experimental condition is a universal constant. Does not depend any experimental condition except one. Electrons should be produced. If electrons are not produced at all, then there is nothing to measure. 
But the minute the electrons are produced and you plot this curve, that means k max plus ev naught is this constant multiplied by the frequency. This is a universal constant. And every time there is a universal constant, the antenna of a physicist goes up and says, I have found a new physical phenomenon. Nature is giving me glimpses of some new truth, something that I did not know earlier. That is exactly what Maxwell did. When he found that 1 over root epsilon naught mu naught, epsilon naught is a number, mu naught is a number, it matched with the speed of light. That means immediately there was a flash of uh, brilliance. He said, Are, optics cannot be different from electromagnetic phenomena. That means there must be a new fundamental physics that is emerging. So in that case, we should quickly do a dimensional analysis because new physics comes not when there is a dimensionless number, but always when there is a dimensionful number. Relativity came when there was a new dimensionful number. What was that? The speed of light. Thermodynamics comes with your what? With your concept of your dimensionful number can be taken to be the Boltzmann constant. In fact, the concept of temperature is related to energy through the Boltzmann constant. So in a similar manner here, you have a dimensionful number. So you are dividing energy by frequency. If you did the calculation, that is nothing but energy into time. So again, there is a mistake in that slide. The, let us correct the expression. In this slide, the dimension is m l squared t minus 1, which is energy into time. So this PDF file is not easily editable. It is going to interrupt our whole uh, discussion. Since we don't want to lose continuity, please remember this is missing in this slide. OK, so we have corrected that. So now, first of all, we have to know what this work function is. The work function I have defined for you depends on the metal, obviously. Not all conductors are the same. So if you go across the periodic table, you start with sodium, potassium, you have all kinds of materials. So what you do is to shine light and you look at the work function. And you will study a lot deal about these work functions and contact potentials when you do semiconductors. Your p-n junction, n-p-n junction, transistors, everything is dependent on the fact that the work functions for the two materials is different and it creates what is called as a contact potential. That is what you are going to study. And that is responsible for the exotic properties of these many of these semiconductors. So you know how great uh, those properties are because we put them into very, very good use. So it is good for us to know what these work functions are. So go and Google, open up Wikipedia, for example, they will give you the work function. Now this is arranged in the alphabetical order, not according to the periodic table. So the advantage is that if you want to know what the work function of any material is, you can go quickly. If it were according to periodic table, then you would have to remember the periodic table. So it starts with Ag, silver, gold, aluminum, etc., etc. Sodium is somewhere here, for example, at 2.36 electron volt. So some of them are very large. See, for example, my gold has a very large work function ranging from 5.1 to 5.47. Probably that is the highest. So the advantage is that when you arrange these work functions for various elements in the alphabetical order, you can look up the work function in an easy way. If it were arranged according to the periodic table, it would be difficult. However, if you want to understand the physics behind, we should arrange it according to the periodic table because we would like to know how the work function changes when you move along a row and when you move along a column because that is how the electrons are filled in shells. But never mind, we have not yet even arrived at the Bohr model, let alone understanding an atomic system. So for us, the alphabetical order should do very well. So we start with uh, silver. 
which varies from 4.26 to 4.74. This is very important for us, that there is a certain variation. So you should already start wondering, what is this variation? If there is a variation, how will I find a constant slope? That is a natural question. Of course, there are some materials which don't have that. For instance, calcium has a good number 2.87. You can see that here. Where is calcium? Here. Cadmium has 4.08. Chromium has 4.5. And our favorite material, namely sodium, has 2.36, one of the smallest. In fact, on sodium, even visible light would do if you send blue radiation. You don't need ultraviolet or uh, you don't need the X-rays. But on the other hand, if you look at osmium, which is the largest in this particular table, it is 5.93. You would require higher energies. So we could keep going down the table. So this is the list one. There is a continuation in the next list too. So again, you have, you see, variations for rubidium, which goes from 2.261. So somebody has measured it to a great accuracy. People have taken great pain. Whereas this, metal, this material TA has a large variation between 4.00 to 4.80. Uranium has a variation from 3.63 to 3.90. So we have a reasonably good information. In fact, an extensive information on the work functions of various materials. So what we want to see is what happens when I perform an experiment by impinging light on these materials and look at the photoelectric current and also the stopping potential as a function of frequencies. That is what we want to know. So this is the list that we have. I wanted to show you and I wanted you people to appreciate how painstakingly these experiments are done because we should never forget that physics is an experimental science. It is not metaphysics. So let us move to the next slide. So I told you that we have to worry about the fact that for many materials, there is a certain variation. So let me go up and uh, to the previous page and show you the information again. The very first entry, silver, varies from 4.26 to 4.74. So there is a difference of about something like 0.5 electron volts. That is what we are saying, which is not insignificant. So what I have done is to write down the work potentials for various surfaces. So it is not as if silver is one homogeneous material, uniform in all directions. And there is an experimental error, and we are writing something between 4.26 to 4.64. There are various phases. After all, it's a crystal. So if you look at this silver, so they are labeled by the synthesis 100, 110, 11, etc. So you can look upon them as some kind of coordinates. It is not very important for us. Now you see different surfaces are showing different work potentials. It is very, very important for us. So these phases will all be adjacent to each other. So we are looking at a crystal, let us say. So that is what I have. There is no correlation between what is shown in this table and what I am going to write. So let us say this was 4.64. And let us say this was 4.52. And let us say this bottom phase, whatever. This bottom phase was 4.74. So what are we saying? If I want to ionize an electron from this particular surface and take it to infinity, that is how we define the work function, you will require about 4.52 electron volt. Whereas, if I look at the upper surface, you would require 4.64 electron volts. So that means, if I took this electron, took it to infinity, by infinity I mean all interaction has ceased. So I take it here and I bring out here, then you see, it has not come back to its original energy, although it is the same material, because there is a mismatch of 4.64 minus 4.52. That is what it is. It is about 0.12 electron volts. That means at this point, at this contact, there is a potential difference. Now, every time there is a potential difference, there is an electric field. And 
Mr. Coulomb will tell us, or Gauss's law will tell us, divergence is equal to 4 pi rho, there must be an accumulation of charge at that particular point. How is it produced? Now, if you take a crystal and put it in great ultra vacuum or some such thing in a very pure atmosphere, maybe that thing will be there. We cannot imagine that the early experimentalists created such a thing. So every time there is such an electric field, you know, there is a lot of dust that always gets attracted to this. So the dust will settle on these surfaces especially at these corners. Therefore, your experiment will actually get compromised if you do not pay attention to this. In fact, one of the great accomplishments of Millikan was to pay attention to this and do very, very careful experiments. So when I will discuss that in a little bit more detail, not in complete detail, when I discuss Millikan's experiment. So we should remember that when we say that people saw a universal slope, it is not like the graph. In fact, I wanted to put the graph here. I did not put that, where that straight line is shown in a qualitative way. So your textbook says, here is my frequency, and here is my energy. That is what they say. And they draw a line. And the x-axis and the y-axis have no entries. That is not going to help us if we want to appreciate. So we need entries. We need numbers. That is very, very important for us. And that is the reason why I gave this piece of information. So, here is the experimental apparatus of Millikan. I am not going to discuss all the experiments that the other people did, because uh, if you go and look up the original paper of Millikan in Physical Review, it is an eminently readable paper, published in 1916. The results were obtained in 1915. So, you can see the cathode ray tube, the collecting uh, anode, etc., etc. So we will not spend time on that. I just wanted you people to get a flavor of the whole thing. And then, you know, the vacuum is created in the chamber, etc. So what we shall move on is to discuss the most important thing for us, and that is the universality. So as I told you in one of the lectures, in my slide, if there is a word called ACK, that means acknowledgement. So we are acknowledging Millikan, this is from Millikan's result, which is reproduced. And this information of color, wavelength, frequency, and photon energy is from Wiki Commons. So you can go and verify that if you feel like. So here is the experiment that you have. So this experiment is done for various frequencies. You can see the frequency is changing here in units of 10 to the power of 14. So look at this, 400 terahertz. Tera is 10 to the power of 12. 400 is 10 squared. So you have something like 10 to the power of 14. It is in this range. You start all the way from red, and you go all the way up to violet. So you have about how many points? You have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 points. They are roughly lying on a straight line. In fact, it is an excellent straight line. It is a pity that there are no error bars. But the paper certainly has information on the error bars. Never mind about it. So the bins are also given for you, because uh, it is not like two points define a line, three points define a plane. That is only in mathematics. In experiments, if you want to show that some experimental numbers are falling on a straight line, you will have to take as many points as possible. So let us say the theory predicts that they should fall on a straight line. Your experimental numbers will typically fall like this. There might be some errors also. Larger the number of points, better it is for us. So here you have, as I told you, about six points. Never mind about that. The bin is also very, very important. If they are very, very widely separated, then that experiment has no significance. So he gave a delta nu of 3 into 10 to the power of 14, and he was able to go all the way up to 12, which goes beyond the visible range probably, because the violet is already something like uh, 6 into 10 to the power of 14. So you have gone by a factor of 2 above that in frequency. So this is the experiment as a function of frequency. That is something that we have to remember. So we should never forget, I told you, that the parameters are frequency, intensity of the radiation, and the material. And this is on sodium metal. Sodium, we said, has a potential, what was the work function? That was 2.36 electron volt or so. 
and it is falling right in this this one. Okay. Let us move to the next slide. What Millikan did was to actually explicitly measure, verify that it is independent of the frequency. So you can also keep the frequency and change the other parameters and he measured the slope. So these numbers on the left hand side are given in the angstrom units, 10 to the power of minus 8 centimeters. So you can convert them into the nanometer range if you feel like. So that will make it 312.6 nanometers, so on and so forth. And he determined the slope and look at the remarkable agreement here in terms of 10 to the power of minus 15 volt frequencies. If you multiply it by the electron, this one, then it will be very close to what we call as the Planck constant, 4.11, 4.14, 4.10, so on and so forth, 3.98, 4.04. And the mean turns out to be 4.13 in 10 to the power of minus 15 volt frequencies. Considering the experimental conditions of those days, it is quite remarkable. It is there in the 1916 paper. You could, of course, do a slightly better analysis than what I have shown in this particular uh, picture. You can even compute the standard deviation, take the mean, subtract each of these numbers from the mean, square them, add them all up, divide by the total number and take the square root. That is the definition of the standard deviation. You will find that it is a pretty small number. So this is the next evidence for the universality. So let me give you the results. Then I will show you some more results. These are directly lifted from Millikan's paper. And these sentences are so well written. I was taking up some books. We have essentially lifted those sentences and nobody will accuse us of plagiarism <laughs> because they are written very, very well. Your 12th standard textbook is actually also no different. So Milligan says that there exists, we conclude, that is the sentence above, that there exists for each exciting frequency nu, above a certain critical value, a definitely determinable maximum velocity of emission of corpuscles. So he uses the word corpuscles, he does not use the word electron. He concludes that there is a linear relation between the voltage and the frequency. Then he says that the slope dv by d nu or the slope of vv line is numerically equal to h by e. Remember, Planck introduced the Planck's constant in 1900 for black body radiation. Einstein made use of that in 1905. Compton scattering was probably sometime around in 1911 where the concept of the momentum of the photon was also introduced by making use of the Planck constant. Planck constant had been determined experimentally from the black body radiation. Now, if you believe in the Einstein hypothesis, this should also be experimentally determinable and we should compare the numbers. And that we are going to do when we discuss the theory. That is what we are going to do. So this is in anticipation of whatever we are going to discuss. So, P equal to H nu naught, that the intercept of the VV line is the lowest frequency at which the metal in question can be photoelectrically active, and that the contact EMF between any two conductors is given by this equation. I told you a lot about the contact potential, so this is also something that he did. If you read this exper his experimental paper carefully, which does not require a knowledge much more than what you have studied in your 12th standard, you may require a little bit more, there is a very extensive critique, discussion of the earlier experiments and he points out why the results obtained by the earlier experimentalists were not very accurate, including those of Lennart actually, because of the points that I mentioned. There was deposition on the surfaces because of the contact potential, it was difficult to clean them, there was not enough vacuum, so on and so forth. But Millikan, over a period of 10 years, dedicated his life to the cause of investigating photoelectric effect. And please remember, Millikan did not believe in the Einstein explanation. Therefore, being an adversary, he had a great, great motivation to do the experiments carefully. It is always the believer who will be a little bit sloppy, but the non-believer will look at everything with a fine comb, with a powerful lens. So we should be grateful to Millikan for that. So here is a result which is on zinc which was performed in 2013. 
those results were shown in uh, for sodium but these results are shown for zinc so you can go back and look up the work function for zinc i don't want to do that now so this is the extrapolated line so you see the visible spectrum is shown here between 4 and 8 that is what they have done beyond that is the ultraviolet X-ray, so on and so forth. So in the visible range, you don't see that at all because the work function for zinc is much larger. And again, you see there are four points which are beautifully falling on a straight line. So this is again another example of universality. It does not matter whether you look at zinc. It does not matter whether you look at sodium or potassium or silver. It doesn't matter which frequency range you look at. And of course, all these people used different intensities. This slope is a universal constant. And I should repeat, every time you find a universal constant, a physicist will say, I have discovered new physics. I will repeat, when there was this universal constant C identified by Maxwell, it caused a unification of two different fields. And what are the two different fields? Optics and electromagnetism. Until that time, people believed there were two different branches of physics. They became, they got merged into one, electromagnetic theory and optics as a branch. So some such similar thing, some great revolution should take place here also. So we have a glimpse of what is happening. So what are the important points that we have to notice at this particular point? The important points that you can notice, so I can go back to my previous slide and show you, there is a minimum frequency. So the minimum frequency here is located at, let us say, 10.4. Okay, that is shown here. So that is your work function, right? That is the potential the energy required to liberate an electron. And if I probably went back to the earlier slide, here it is something like close to 5 electron volts. So there is a minimum frequency. Below the minimum frequency, you can vary your intensity. You can do anything you want. Your electrons will refuse to budge they will stay put in the metal, they will stay put in that whatever that surface is, you cannot liberate them. But we are going to, we have been asserting that energy depends on the amplitude, on the intensity, but the electrons refuse to buy that argument. That is what we have to notice. What is the next thing that we have to remember? Once I cross the barrier, once I am able to overcome that frequency barrier, I go beyond that minimum frequency. Now, they merely depend on the intensity. It will be proportional to the intensity. They start agreeing with Maxwell who says, the energy with which the electron is liberated depends on the intensity. So, there is a kind of a double game that is being played by the electron. The electron does not acknowledge that the energy is proportional to intensity below a certain frequency. It is as if suddenly Maxwell's equations failed. Is that okay? As if. Huh? Not really. And the minute you cross the frequency, everything becomes fine. It, it becomes proportional to the intensity. So for some reason, I have written that again, probably because I thought it is a very, very important point. No emission below the minimum frequency. And what kind of a behavior is there between the frequency and the stopping potential? It is a straight line. And today, with so many, so many experiments that have been performed, we can say without any doubt, without any ambiguity, that this experiment is as well verified, as decisive as Young's double slit experiment, which have been repeated for a whole range of frequencies and intensities. That is something that we have to remember. So we have Young versus Millikan. This is the double slit experiment. And this is the photoelectric. You may say, look here. Young did experiments in some visible region. If you forget about sodium, for all that you need higher frequencies. So is it possible that this wave description is valid only in the small window? For example, in the electromagnetic spectrum, the answer is no. 
because I told you the great experiments of Hertz and J.C. Bose showed that you find diffraction, interference, everything even in the infrared region. Okay, where it in the microwave region. So verified all over. You must have heard of X-ray diffraction, where it shows wave-like property when you go higher up. And the same X-ray, so let me write that, X-ray diffraction, you have already studied diffraction in your optics. And the same X-ray is showing what? A different behavior. Why is it a different behavior? Because it is saying that depending on the work function, Either the electron will be emitted or it will not be emitted. That is what we are saying. So this is what nowadays in modern world, people call it as a conundrum. In, when we were students, we used to call it a paradox or an apparent contradiction. So what is happening with Millikan experiment and how are we going to reconcile with the wave theory? One of the distinct features of physics ever since Galileo did these experiments, both real experiments and thought experiments, is that physics asks modest questions. So if you go back and read the earlier quote-unquote scientists or philosophers, they were all interested in deep questions, ultimate questions. What is the origin of the universe? What is the nature of life? What is happening? What is the ultimate reality? Is the world real or unreal? Is the mind made of matter or is matter a projection of mind? These are the great debates that raged all over the world. But the great contribution of Galileo, Newton, etc. is that they said that we will not ask all those questions, we will ask simple questions. We ask questions, what is light made of when I do an experiment? Aristotle said that lighter objects go up and heavier objects come down. Obviously, he was looking at leaves which were floating in air or scraps of paper which were floating in air and stone which was falling. It was not made in uh, some kind of vacuum. It is not that Aristotle did not observe phenomena, but that is what he observed. But a very careful experiment was actually done by Galileo. What did he do? He went up the leaning tower of Pisa. So there is the leaning tower of Pisa. And he dropped two different materials of two different weights, two different masses. And he took a clock and asked, how long does it take to reach? OK, you have to be a little bit intelligent. You don't drop something, for example, like a cotton, you know, a wad of cotton, you know, puffy cotton. And you don't drop a stone. We have to have that much common sense. But you can take, you know, a nickel and gold or piece of nickel and gold or whatever and drop them and he found it is roughly the same. And this very simple experiment contained the seeds of the most revolutionary theory, theory of gravitation. And we all use that when we write the motion of a particle in a gravitational field, we write m a is equal to g m m by r squared and with impunity, Without batting an eyelid, we cancel the m on both the sides. We say all particles, irrespective of their masses, have the same acceleration depending on what the gravitational force is. So what happened to the concept of inertia that Newton told us? Newton told us that, look here, as you keep on increasing the mass, inertia should change. But here, nature is playing a trick on us. It is saying, on the left-hand side, it is inertia. On the right-hand side, it is the response to the force. And they are exactly balancing, counterbalancing or cancelling each other. So this is the result of an experiment. So as I told you, physics asks modest questions. We don't ask very, very deep questions. So for that reason, when we want to reconcile what is happening with Hertz, Lennard, Millikan, Halowak experiments, and what is happening with the experiments of Young and his successors, diffraction experiments, Nicole Prism, you know, ordinary day, extraordinary day, and the interference spinders, so on and so forth. When we are seeing there is a contradiction between them, we should not immediately try to develop a theory, because then we may get lost in wilderness. First, we should try to build a nice model for understanding this phenomenon. Then we will ask how to reconcile 
this model with another model. They may appear to be contradictory with each other, but never mind about that. Contradictions can be reconciled later. In other words, do not try to answer all the questions at once. Try to answer one question at a time. That is what we want to do. And that is what Einstein attempted to do. But before we jump to discuss what Einstein did, we need some numerical numbers. As I told you, physics is what? A numerical science. It is not numerology, but it is a numerical science. So what we cannot calculate is not of much use. So let us go back to what Maxwell told us. I already made use of this in my discussion of the double slit experiment. The energy density carried by a radiation, U radiation, is epsilon naught E squared, where epsilon naught is my permittivity. That is what I have. Now, of course, I am interested in the average because we are interested in RMS values, so on and so forth, which will give me epsilon naught by 2 into E naught squared. So, what have I done here? I have written my E to be a monochromatic plane wave, E naught cos k dot r minus omega t. That is what I have. So, I think there is another expression here. The important thing is, there is no frequency dependence. But from the principle of conservation of energy, which is a very, very sacred principle, nobody would dare violate that. Principle of conservation of energy. Minimum energy required depends on frequency. Minimum energy required what? For photo emission of electrons. Photo is light. And this is we want to reconcile. This is what we have to understand. So what I will do is, since I am running out of time, and it is also logically the correct thing to do, I will discuss what kind of a contradiction we get. I will show you that the order of magnitude difference between the prediction of Maxwell theory with experimental observation is 10 to the power of 19. We are off by 10 to the power of 19. I am not very sure. It could be 10 to the power of 16. A factor of 10 to the power of 15 to 16. Please ignore 10 to the power of 19. So that means it is not a small correction to the classical theory. It is going to be a very, very drastic thing. And we will take up in the next lecture. Please go back. Read your textbook carefully again. Discuss with your teachers. And if you have a net, and if you have an opportunity, if there is a college nearby, try to read Millikan's paper. We will all be much wiser and richer. Thank you.